All right, so we're talking in this chapter about selecting refrigerants. When do you think mechanical refrigeration really came on the scene in the Industrial Revolution? I mean, you think it was around in 1800s, 1600s, 1200s? No way. It really is fairly recent. It's like the internal combustion engine. It's really recent in the history of mankind. And it was after the internal combustion engine, not before the internal. When you start understanding and developing mechanical refrigeration, there's the working fluid and picking a working fluid. Water is a great working fluid to make a vapor power cycle. Air is a great working fluid for the gas power cycles when you're doing combustion. But refrigerants typically are man-made. Uh, there are some natural refrigerants. Like uh, you can use propane, you can use different gases, even methane, carbon dioxide. You can use it as a refrigerant, but a lot of refrigerants over the years have been man-made. Well, so when you select a refrigerant, you think about thermal performance. At what temperature is it going to evaporate? At what pressure? You know, you got to contain it at that pressure. Likewise, you need to reject heat outside to a high temperature, typically maybe, I don't know, 120 degrees F, 125 degree F. You need it to work on a hot day and reject heat. So you want it to can condense it. That, uh, temperature at reasonable pressures. All right, safety. I hate to say it, but refrigerant does leak out. If you ever worked with a company that had to do a lot of work, you worked with technicians, they get freezer burn because unfortunately that's sprayed out on their hand, arm. Anybody resonate on that? Yeah, a couple. It's not always going to stay in your system that you design. So safety is, is unfortunately, you have to think about accidents and what will happen when it comes out. And then environment. This was uh, not that much considered before the 70s and 80s, before 60s, really, real, around 1960. It was a big kickoff of environmental concerns about what's going on in society. I'm sure there are people talking about it in the 40s, 50s, et cetera, but it really picked up in 60s, 70s, 80s. Now it's, it's very important. So synthetic refrigerants were developed in the 30s because of toxicity. What does that word toxicity mean to you? It can kill people, yeah. And as well as flammability, it can blow things up, you know, start a fire. And uh, there were previous refrigerants, but they had problems killing people or blowing up. So uh, you could find some very interesting articles. This was in the uh, New York Times, 1929, summer. Uh, and basically, family of three met their demise when uh, the ref mechanical refrigeration system uh, leaked and, and they blamed the, the methyl chloride, that was the refrigerant being used, for their deaths. Uh, it's kind of a gruesome death. The people kind of go a little delirious and then they feel like, oh, they're, they're uh, hot. And so they take off all their clothes and usually they would find the bodies all naked. And they say, oh, what, what kind of party was happening here? No, 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 no. It's not like that, right? It's not a party. Anyway, they were dead in their beds. They were kind of weak. The coroner declared blah, blah, blah. And pff, there you go. You can try to open a window, but uh, you just don't want to be breathing that. So you can find lots of articles. So in the 30s, as a great accomplishment in science and engineering, they developed a lot of synthetic refrigerants. Some of them were used in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then they started to notice, oh, they have some detrimental effects. So when I was young, I would be able to buy refrigerant 12 in a can at the grocery store for under a dollar, one pound. Yeah, and you can't do that anymore. And uh, then you could put it in your air conditioning system, your automobile, and then next month, go get another one because it leaked. And then the next month, go get another can. And I'm just saying what it used to be like. And then they found out, oh no, these uh, coral fluorocarbons, especially this RF-12, had some negative effect. It was from this chlorine part of this, uh, that's R22, but also in the 2012. Uh, and it would get up to higher atmosphere altitudes and then it would interact. Um, so they developed others, like 134A is a very popular one right now. But there's a lot of refrigerants out there. There was a landmark agreement. It was an international agreement uh, anybody worked in the HVAC industry in the 80s and 90s knows about the Montreal Protocol. And so in 1987, they decided they're going to ban the production 
of the chlorine containing refrigerants, especially the refrigerant 12, responsible for why they're going to ban it? Ozone. Ozone layer depletion. You think ozone, ozone, I've heard that word. Well, there's two ozones, one way high in the atmosphere, the stratosphere. We're going to talk about that. That's the bad refrigerant gets out, goes up, and destroys the good ozone way high in the atmosphere. The other ozone is a ground level. Maybe you visited a city in the middle of summer, and there's this not much of a breeze, and you look over the city, and you see this brownish haze, and your little kids are breathing that. Ground level ozone, bad. Stratospheric ozone layer, good. So, brown, breathe it, no good for asthma, no good for little kids and developing lungs. Automobiles especially contribute to that. And it's an it's a interaction with the light, and that's why it peaks in the summer days when it's still intense light. And then it dies and diminishes the ozone content, uh, ground level ozone, in the evenings and nights. And then the next day it's sight and, uh, bright and sunny again, and boom, it's like a blossoming of the of a problem anyway let's take a look you could just type in something like this hey tell me a little bit about the ozone in the upper atmosphere well it's fine it's it's found way up there how far up there uh six to ten miles that's a long way up there isn't it and it can extend up to about 30 miles that's way up there and that's called the stratosphere and so the ozone is o3 and the light comes in and interacts with it, especially the high energy short wavelength light, the UV light. And that layer of the Earth's atmosphere is a little warmer than it would be because it's gobbling up or taking, absorbing that energy of the sun in the UV. And then when they started noticing that layer would develop a hole in it, well, what happened is more of the UV light come down and hit the Earth's surface. That's where we're at. Uh, what type of things do we put on our eyes in the summer to protect our eyes from UV light? Sunglasses. Look at any sunglass you purchase. They'll talk about it. It's UV protection. UVA, UVB, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then what do you put on your skin if you're going to be exposed? You don't want to get sunburned. What gives you sunburn? The short wavelength, high intensity light in the UV. And so it's good then not to have holes in that ozone layer at high altitude. So they say, how does the refrigerant destroy the ozone way up there? Well, it, sort of the chlorine especially, maybe bromine, but I know more about the chlorine. Bad actor gets up there and interacts with the sunlight and then the O3. And it, it uh, doesn't produce the O3, it gobbles up the O3. All right, that's, that's our science lesson for today. Now, so they talk about the ozone depleting potential acronym. ODP and the global warming potential acronym GWP and they list a whole bunch of refrigerants and there's more than on this list but this is gives you the sense of what goes involved is involved in selecting a refrigerant and they say near zero good high number in the global I mean the yeah global warming potential bad and then for the ozone depleting potential, low number, good, high number, bad. So you want a refrigerant that's close to this axis on this funny plot. And you see some refrigerants are, uh-oh, this one may be good for uh, GWP, global warming potential. It's not contributing to greenhouse gases, but it's terrible for the ozone. So that's kind of the trade-offs and where we're at in understanding and selecting refrigerants. <laughs> Prior to the Montreal Protocol, eh, scientists are talking about holes in the ozone, but, and really not much talk about the global warming and greenhouse gases. The rest of your life, more and more engineers will be working on problems associated with the environmental impact of what we do. All right. CO2, you would think, wow, that's a gas. Yeah, do you know where some CO2 is? Everybody exhale, right? There you go, CO2 is coming out of your mouth. You're a producer, you're a producer of CO2. Thankfully, there's plants to get rid of that waste, your waste, and they photosynthesis. Anyway, it's a refrigerant, for, there's a number for it. 
Like I said, propanes and all kinds of different substances have been used, are used, maybe not heavily used as refrigerants, but CO2 is, can be used as a refrigerant. You think about it, how am I going to get it to work as a refrigerant? Well, you better put it through some very high pressures. And if it has into a system with high pressure, uh, what is a potential engineering challenge? Leaking. Leaking out. You're going to have to seal it. And then also, it's good in the sense that you may not need a big tube or a, or a, a large area for the heat transfer or the moving of the fluid or the speed of the fluid. So the density when it goes up is good. So there's all trade-offs. This is bad. This is good. From a heat transfer point of view, higher density fluid is good for heat transfer. Study heat transfer when you get to that class. Oh, CO2. It's relatively inexpensive and it's relatively available. It's, I know it costs some money, but it's pretty cheap. That's really good. And then it's a stable molecule. You don't want something breaking down inside the system. That happens as you heat it up, cool it off, heat it up, cool it off. That's good. And then another big one that people are really concerned with, what's the potential that the legislature gets together or international protocol a meeting gets together and outlaws it? And so it is a real concern because then some people figure out, oh, no, we need to get rid of that one, too. They continue to, to raid them and, and then uh, put them out to pasture, so to speak. So what do you want for global warming potential? You want it to be low. What about CO2? If you go back and look at this plot that I showed, what is relative to what? It's normalized to CO2. <laughs> So it's like, uh, you know, CO2 is CO2's global warming potential normalized to one, which is low, and that's good. And then ozone depleting potential, no, it doesn't do it. I don't know exact number, but I just said it's zero. It's low, low is good, right? Well, different companies have different schemes uh, to make, uh, you know, mechanical refrigeration. And this is a big chiller. This is uh, made it by train. I just grabbed it. I grab it to show you, look it, they're using this refrigerant, that refrigerant. You know what? I don't know those refrigerants. But why are they, what are they saying? Oh, it's got a lower global warming potential. This is just out of some publication, some trade magazine. And uh, you'll see that where they're doing work in developing these chillers and optimizing them based on the refrigerants. Okay, let's press on. There's a number of clicker questions that I have. So when selecting a refrigerant, what is least, not most, what's least important when you select a refrigerant? Performance, safety, environmental impact, or initial cost? And we'll show the results. And money isn't always the driver. Refrigerant 12 was really, really cheap. But, and it had great thermal characteristics. Blah, blah, blah. It was good for safety. What was the Achilles heel? Environmental issues. So it's not always the initial cost. That's surprising to a lot of students. All right, here's another one. The ozone depleting potential and the global warming potential. Refrigerant should have what? Very good. We want low global warming potential, low ozone depleting potential. Now you know what both of those are. Montreal Protocol. Why has refrigerant 12 been phased out? Too expensive, harmful to the atmosphere, toxic, flammable, or the manufacturers in Montreal and Protocol agreed to stop making them in 1987. I've asked this question lots of times on different classes, and it always amazes me. There's no city of protocol. There was a city called Montreal, and they had an international group that got there, and they had some protocol. I don't know why they call it that. And they, they had an international agreement. So this is all so tempting, but no, no, no. E is not the right one. What's the right one? It's... Harmful, harmful to the atmosphere. But, yeah. Carbon dioxide continues to be considered as a refrigerant because 
it has what? Ozone depleting potential of zero, global warming potential of one, or both A and B. There we go. Let's take a look. Very good. Remember the benchmark for global warming was CO2 itself. So it had a global warming potential of one. Uh, maybe that's why the person, one person didn't like it. Okay. Uh, which has not been used as refrigerant? Methyl chloride, diethylene glycol, dichloral difluoromethane, carbon dioxide, or chloral difluoromethane? Go for it. Everybody in? Oh, you got to guess, man. Sorry about that. Well, you get one point at least for guessing. So let's show the results. Well, what is this? So how many people remember diethylene glycol is a colorless, soluble liquid used as antifreeze? Oh, man, that's below the belt, Professor. That was a nasty question. Unfair, unfair. Okay, fine, 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 fine. All right. What percentage of refrigerants eventually leak into the atmosphere? Let's say you're a manufacturer and you put out air conditioning systems and you produced and you sold blah, blah, blah. So many tons of refrigerant went out your door in 20, whatever, 2019. What percent of those pounds of refrigerant will eventually leak into the atmosphere? All right, let's uh, shut it down and let's take a look at the results. It really is very, very high. Now, what's the deal with it? Now, this I really didn't explain. If you, but if, but this was a hard question. I'm apologize, but I'm only going to grade those as correct. And if you take a look, this is a good report. You should read it if you got time. They talk about all these different uh, refrigerants, basically. The experts agree that that gas will eventually be released into the atmosphere. Hopefully you enjoyed those.